Okay, now, so for our next speaker, he's Andres Berzin. Uh, he's a local boy. He's the founder of Tech Hub here in Riga. But the particular theme that we're addressing here is the issue of startups and uh, how you support them and what you do to enable uh, technology startups uh, in your area. So, uh, Andres Berzins. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Riga. So, uh, I'm a local boy, but I don't sound local. So the people from South London, if I really push my accent, will have a South London accent. But uh, the farmhouse behind, behind me here is one that uh, looks similar to the farmhouse that my grandparents and my great-grandparents owned and lived in, in, in Latvia. Uh, and uh, my family, unfortunately had to leave during the Second World War, and I ended up uh, growing up outside Latvia, mostly in London, hence the South London accent. But I'm going to talk to you about farmhouses and butter, and how they relate to digital products and services. And you'll be wondering what the connection is. Well, the connection goes back to uh, the independence years between the two world wars, where it may be a little-known fact that Latvia was one of the world's largest exporters of butter. And this is actually made more complicated by the fact that this was mostly from farmhouses, such as the ones you saw in that image, uh, who were producing butter and in cooperatives, delivering it, building a supply chain, all the way to export it outside the country, um, and one of the world's largest exporters. So, what I believe, as we're in the 21st century, is that digital product services technology can be the new butter a new driver of exports for countries like Latvia, and that we're already seeing the success um, and the possibilities that these, these new opportunities are showing for countries like ours. So the home of technology, Silicon Valley, is a long way from Riga. And my connection there is that after returning to Latvia, I then traveled to the valley, uh, to Stanford, to do my MBA, and uh, experienced the dot-com boom in Silicon Valley firsthand. Worked in a number of technology startups, including one that uh, we grew um, and was eventually sold for about a quarter of a billion dollars. So I've been involved in a lot of startups in investing, advising, um, and working in them, and seen that growth and that exciting uh, transition from an idea through to a large company. And in bringing that back, I came back 10 years ago, and there was not that much in terms of technology startups here. We, have some, we had some great IT outsourcing companies, um, a handful of technology firms, but the technology startup scene that was booming uh, elsewhere was not here yet. So about three, four years ago, together with some entrepreneurs, we set up uh, Tech Hub Riga. It's a branch of London's Tech Hub, and it's become the center of the startup ecosystem here in terms of uh, being a nonprofit that gathers a community of startups, of new technology companies, and helps them grow and succeed faster. We run a co-working space. We're already on our second iteration, a larger one now, 900 square meters in the old town of Riga. And we're trying to help this new generation build these new, this new economic growth, what I would call the new butter, the new exports. Let me give you some examples. So one of our uh, early startups and members was uh, Infogram. So these two guys had an idea. Their idea was that they were looking at all of these infographics out there um, in terms of visualizing data, which was really hard to make. You always needed an artist to produce this infographic, uh, which meant it took a long time, and you actually needed to hire a professional to do that. And they had a vision to help anyone whether it be a business, consumer, a teacher, a student, to be able to put data online, present their story, the data behind their story, and do it very easily and simply. This became Infogram. Interactive data visualization, infographics in, a, in an interactive form. So you'll actually have the opportunity to see them tomorrow at a number of the sessions 
uh, the workshops here tomorrow, there'll be uh, people there who are able to, in real time, take the data that you're looking at in the workshop and produce infographics. So Infogram has grown since those two founders started it, and in just a couple of years, they've raised a few million dollars of funding, have about 50 people, and are growing rapidly with a global customer base. Second example is Cobook. Cobook built a, an address book for Mac, uh, for Apple Mac computers, now also for other iOS devices. And in a very short time, won some of the accolades you see up on the screen here for having a fantastic product, amazingly well designed. And in fact, in a very short amount of time, they were acquired by a US startup called Full Contact. The team is still here in Riga, growing and building contact management software, but uh, doing an amazing job building new products with innovative design. And the third example, because in Tech Hub we have mostly IT, internet, software startups, but further, further afield in, in Riga, there are other technology startups building hardware. And AirDog is one of the best uh, known examples very recently. Um, they're building the world's first auto-follow action sports drone. So I'm not sure how many of you out here are surfing fanatics or uh, off-piece skiers or paragliders, but if you want to get your action sports film and you want to uh, be able to get uh, your GoPro video of you on that wave and have that camera follow you, it's pretty hard. You need another guy with a drone and he's flying around behind you. Well, with AirDog, you'll be able to take this drone, put it in your backpack, unfold it, set it up, press a button, and it will fly up and it will follow you at a predetermined speed and direction and take beautiful video of you doing your surfing on the waves. So this company raised $1.3 million on Kickstarter, more venture money since then, and is building this amazing product in a fast-growing niche, the, the, the drone industry. So these are just three, three examples. And they're driven by the changes that we see across the world in terms of the way technology can be used. And these will be familiar to you in terms of cloud hosting, being able to set your software up in the cloud, software as a service, business models, being able to speed the adoption of new, of new products and technologies, global payments. So just five years ago, it was not that easy for a Latvian company to get, take credit card payments globally, and now it's now it's a reality and it's very simple. And crowdfunding and other alternative sources of financing. So what do these mean for a tiny country like Latvia with under two million people? It means we can build companies that are scalable and that are born global, competing across the world and are not limited to our small consumer market. But the world is their oyster from day one. And this is a big difference. It means that this vision of having a massive market out there, the butter market of the world, enables us to add a new dimension to economic growth, uh, where we're actually constrained in terms of the number of people, so we can't build companies with 10,000 pro programmers overnight. We need to be very careful where we use this resource. And so these companies are building intellectual property here, they're building, they're taking their ideas and turning them into reality and building economic value and wealth here. And that will be a major driver of economic growth for Latvia in the future. We've already seen our neighbors, Estonia, do this very well. They have a number of very successful companies. And one in particular, Skype, with its uh, massive global use and the sale and exit and capital generated from that sale has had a massive impact on the technology community in Estonia, and on the public awareness and thinking about uh, e-services, electronics, digital, and so forth. So this is all possible and will accelerate. But uh, the future is rosy, but it has some road bumps. And there's a couple that I wanted to point out um, as an entrepreneur. So one of them is, as we think about policy, it's important to understand that startups are not a classic SME. So yes, they're small enterprises. But as I've seen a lot of discussion around EU policy making, it largely addresses two business groups, large enterprises and SMEs. 
And the difference between this hairdressing salon in a Chinatown and the new technology startups and the digital, uh, the, di the digital startups that are the subject of digital single market, the difference is that these new startups on day one, with perhaps one, two, three, five employees, have to deal with global tax administration, regulation, legal, uh, financial accounting issues. So the measure of complexity from day one is much higher. And that means that not all the traditional way of thinking about policy is, is going to measure. And as an entrepreneur, I challenge you to say that it's almost easier sometimes to sell to the USA and other countries outside the EU than it is to sell other, to other countries within the EU. So I have a startup which recently made its first sales to Australia and, England, uh, and uh, the USA. And those were relatively straightforward. I sent an invoice, 0% VAT, book, booked the sale, got the cash in the bank. Very simple. With other EU countries, we face a challenge, in particular with the recent changes in VAT rules. They mean that the administrative burden selling within the EU almost becomes bigger than exporting outside it. And what everyone needs to understand is that startups, are, they're like water, they run downhill, they go where it's easiest. And what I wouldn't want to see happen is that these great innovators decide it's easier to just move the hell out to Silicon Valley. So I think there's great opportunities, but we need to think very well about how we support them and how we give them the opportunity to thrive. Because the failure rate is high, and we want to, we want to minimize that failure rate and have maximum success. So in terms of the single market, I would lay down a challenge to think about how to make it easy. And all the key things that a startup needs to do in its early days, company formation, web domains, VAT, hiring small numbers of people, and so forth, make that really easy, make that really simple, so that we can drive the success and we can build these new businesses and industries that we need for economic growth. So that's it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Can we have the lights up? Uh, that was terrific. How cool is AirDog? I mean, wouldn't you just love it? Um, yes. If, if I went surfing or skiing, I'd love it. Anyway, you would. Now, you mentioned failure there, and that's particularly interesting, I think, in this uh, arena, because there is, a, there is a stigma to failure in business, mm -hmm. but actually, you should expect failure, because uh, you know, not every company is going to succeed, and actually, you get better through failure. How are we going to tackle that particular problem? So I think there's several aspects to it. So I think one of it is simply a social problem. Uh, so uh, in Europe, uh, there is much more of a stigma attached to failure than there is, say, in, say in the US. Um, and uh, until recently, now it's changing a little bit, but until recently, you would not have bragged about the fact that you burnt $50,000 of investment money um, with a startup which didn't work out. Um, and the, the challenge is making that acceptable. Obviously, you would have liked a different outcome, but uh, for employers especially to look at uh, time spent, especially by young people, in pursuing a dream and finding that it didn't work out and understanding what the, what the lessons learned are for those people and how they apply to doing other things. And I think, so I think there's a social aspect to it. The other aspect to it is legal in terms of the complexity in some EU nations of bankruptcy law, which means that the pain of failure is very large, which sometimes puts off people trying. And we don't want to put them off trying. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Twitter very Meister. quickly, very quickly from no. Twitter. People are, people are excited about the, the presentation. For example, Guido Brinkel says that best speech so far delivered. So congratulations. Thank you. But I, I have also some question. I have also actually two questions from Augustine Reina, who is asking that um, you quoted great examples from Europe's tech potential. What must politicians do to help startups, and what do you expect from the EU? Okay, I'm going to give you a magic wand. What would you like implemented magic tomorrow? Magic wand. Go back to my last slide. Um, so the, 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 the points on that last slide, I don't know if can we can do that? Pull, it, no. pull it back up again. Um, can we return to that? No, let's right. not worry about anyway, that. Anyway, um, so, so the, the, 
the point from that um, slide were basically to make it really easy to do the basic things that a startup needs to do. Um, and this, uh, this uh, list was actually, it's one sent in by an organization called Allied for Startups, which sent this into the EU on the announcement of the digital single market concept. Um, and these are the basic things that a startup needs to do, which they struggle with the most. So making it really simple to hire small numbers of people. We're not talking here about large corporations where obviously the hiring policies need to be much more, uh, much more robust, but a small startup will simply not hire the next person if it's too expensive to have to fire them, right? Because the, the reality is that there's not just failure, but every single startup goes through a point where they have to make massive changes in what they're doing because you never get it right the first time. And that might mean laying people off. But in order to survive, you have to take those tough decisions. So these kind of things, making these things easier, that would be on my wish list. OK, uh, let's have the lights up. Uh, and any questions uh, from you? Um, OK, there's a lady down here. Where is our? Let's start with this lady down here. So if you'd stand up, and the microphone is coming to you very soon. And uh, just tell me your name and where you're from. Anna Nitiksza from uh, European Economic and Social Committee, but also entrepreneur in Poland. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what do you think about co-financing by the EU of the seed capital funds? Uh, it was an initiative launched in a few uh, new member states. Uh, startups were receiving by 200,000 euro each to start. Uh, the new company, but it's a very small amount of money. But do you think that is it a competition to seed capital funds founded by uh, people like you, or is it useful? And how do you see the procedure uh, next to finance, to co-finance, to facilitate the development of new uh, high-tech uh, companies? Thank okay. you. Thank you. I think this is a great question, and actually the wording is very important. So you use the word co-financing. Co-financing is the key. So I've seen a number of initiatives, um, both the national government in the past, from the EU, which have been talking about grant money. Um, grant money is great for basic research. But when it comes to startups, what you want is you want the, the, the support to come in co-financing and require private investors to invest usually 50-50. And that means that the, the incentives are aligned and the money that is used from the EU to support startups will be used in the place where private investors are willing to put their own money. And this can be at all different phases. It can be an, a business angel co-investment fund, it can be siege stage, it can be growth stage. And uh, Latvia is already looking at a number more of these. They ha we, we have a few of these kind of uh, um, EU-supported funds. And they're great for helping grow the venture capital and investment community in Eastern Europe where we, have, where we don't have the history of capital, right? So Western Europe has a lot more cap capital uh, than, than we do. So they're a very good vehicle for doing this, as long as it's a 50-50 Evenly split. Okay, that message uh, firmly received. Uh, there's a question back there, sir. Uh, Carlos Blumenthal, startup entrepreneur from uh, Latvia. Uh, well, and what's your company? Tell us, we'd, we'd like to advertise it to the world. Uh, my company is uh, Mozello, a website and e shop building a service that enables small businesses to create their uh, online websites and online stores uh, that comply with EU regulations faster and easier than it was uh, ever possible before. And uh, the question uh, for me is um, why you mentioned uh, new opportunities like cloud computing, crowdsourcing and others, why it's almost uh, not uh, taught in universities in the educational programs, uh, in IT educational programs, because uh, I and many of my friends have studied uh, at the university the computer science, and we were taught uh, physics and other stuff, but uh, okay, no we, we, nothing of these modern things Okay, is we taught. get the drift what? of that question, so we're yeah, short so, of time. So, so Carly, I think, I think the answer is that um, this is a real challenge, especially for IT education. So keeping up 
with the advance in technology and transferring that to the academic environment is a massive challenge. And I think we may see IT education move to, you know, perhaps sort of a teaching you the basic principles, but letting, letting you uh, learn the newest and greatest programming languages and so forth together with business and internships or whatever else, because I think it's realistically very hard for the IT industry, for the academics, to keep up with those changes. Um, I know in, an, in another life, I'm uh, Vice Chairman of Council of University College London, and we offer entrepreneurship classes to all our students. Yep. Uh, and, and actually, it's uh, physics and computer science that take mm -hmm. them up most. Yep. Uh, we have t time for one very brief question. Sir, can it be a very quick one? Okay, here comes the microphone. Uh, yeah, shout very loudly. Okay. Okay, so let me repeat that. Is there room for a startup ecosystem in every EU member state? Absolutely. So I believe there is. And obviously, uh, you know, I think it's a misnomer to say, you know, we can we'll develop the Silicon Valley or wherever. Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley. And I think it will be um, a very long time before anyone replaces that. But every, every community that has any decent size of uh, programming, design, development uh, community can build innovative uh, startups. And those communities, what we tend to find is, is the most important communications are locally. So it's getting people to help each other. And the guy that goes in Tech Hub to the, to, to the coffee machine, he may have talked to Facebook last week and have a contact for some other guy who's in a different, building a different startup, but he, they can help each other. So these local connections are as important as the international ones. Fantastic, but obviously not too quickly <laughs> exactly. to compete with you. Right, yes. marvelous. Thank you so much, Andres Brevin. Thank you.